Hello, hello, and welcome to our COP online evening services. You know what I'm going to say. This is the moment I've been waiting for when we could be together again. Psalm 91, he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust, for he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrows that fly by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only look with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord your dwelling place, the Most High, who is my refuge, no evil shall be allowed to befall you, no plague come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the adder, the young lion and the serpent you will trample underfoot. Because he holds fast to me in love, I will deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name. When he calls to me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Amen. Wow. What a beautiful psalm that we have come to rely upon, to be blessed by, to be comforted by. It says, with long life, I will satisfy him. Let's look at that thought again of being satisfied with the long life that he gives us. Proverbs 19.23, the fear of the Lord leads to life, and whoever has it, rests satisfied. He will not be visited by harm. That's like a companion verse, isn't it? It just goes, that's Proverbs 19.23. I think I said Psalms, Proverbs 19.23. It, it goes with that so beautifully with Psalm 91. Rest satisfied. You know, at this time, it's summer in the homeland, <laughs> And it's warm. Well, okay, it's hot, very hot. And for a lot of us, we can't get out of the house. We can't go out and enjoy a nice walk and fresh air, breezes. It's not the usual summertime thinking that we have. Our kids are not running to the pools and the beaches. It's not the usual summertime. In fact, our heads are full a lot of times with anxiety. You might be thinking about your job. You might be thinking about job security. You might be thinking about your future and what God might have for you in your future. So many, many thoughts filling your head. And when you lay your head on the pillow at night, there you go, thinking of all these things. But this verse says, he will rest satisfied. And this is what I really want you to get, that you can rest in the Lord. And when you go to bed at night, you lay your head upon the pillow, <laughs> you're going to have sweet dreams of the goodness of God and his blessings in your life. You know, we have this little four-year-old, one of our families has a four-year-old. <laughs> and yesterday I heard this story, how she woke up, running out of the her bedroom, just happy, happy, so joyful. And they asked her why. And she said, because I had a dream that Jesus came and killed the virus. And I went back to school. Out of the mouth of babes, right? <laughs> out of the mouth of babes, the faith of a child 
Jesus said that, thank you, Lord, he- Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. We need to come to the Lord as a little child, have the faith of a child, that he's got this, that he's got your family, he's got your kids, he's got where the paycheck is going to come from. He's got this. Matthew 18, verses 2 to 4, And calling to him a child, he put him in the midst of them and said, Truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Okay? The faith of a child. Rest in the Lord. You are under his wings. You are sheltered by the Lord Almighty. Let's have this faith of a child and let's rest satisfied. And let's go and worship the Lord together.
Amen. Thank you, Lord. We love to worship you. Amen. In heaven, what does worship look like? Because we have this prayer that we pray a lot. May it be on earth as it is in heaven. We want to pattern our worship after heavenly worship. How can we find heavenly worship? By looking at the book of Revelation and seeing what's going on in heaven. We sing new songs in heaven, and we have talked about that. But today I want to look at one category, again, of songs that we will sing in heaven. What's that category? Old songs. Oh, you're saying, oh, yes, I love the old songs. I love the new songs, but I love the old songs. <laughs> I know you, COP. I know you love new songs. Every time we sing a new song at church, the next thing I know, everybody's uh, posting the lyrics or talking about the song or trying to post the song on your social media. That's awesome. People like new songs, but people like the old songs as well. So what's your definition of an old song? Is it a song that is written before you were born? Is it a song that's, oh, that song is 10 years old. That's an old song. Well, let's see how old the songs are that they're singing in heaven. Revelation 15, starting in verse 2. And I saw what looked like a sea of glass mixed with fire, and standing beside the sea, those who had been victorious over the beast and his image and over the number of his name. They held harps given to them by God. Well, we could stop right there and say, are you a musician and you want an instrument? <laughs> God loves to give out instruments. They held harps given them by God. You can claim an instrument. Oh, Lord, I want that new guitar. Ask God for it. He gives out instruments. And then verse 3, and they sang the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. Great and marvelous are your deeds, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, King of the ages. <laughs> wow. Talk about old songs being sung here. Some churches want to sing nothing but new songs. Some churches want to sing nothing but old songs. And by the way, the old hymns we sing in church, they're actually pretty recent compared to the songs of Moses. Moses lived a long time ago. But in Revelation, in heaven, we'll be singing a mix of the old and the new. I would love to hear the song that Moses wrote in collaboration with the Lamb. Whoa, <laughs> I would love to hear that song and make it a part of my worship. And who knows, maybe one day in heaven, I'll get to write a song with the Lamb. Whoa, that would be beautiful. The Lamb of God, Revelation 1 verse 5. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood. Did you know, when you think of the book of Revelation, some people think the book of Revelation is about Oh, you can read that and then you can find about 666 and you can find about the beast and all the mysterious prophecies. Do you know that when you read the book of Revelation, chapter 1, verse 1, it states what the book of Revelation is. The book of Revelation is a revelation of Jesus Christ. A revelation of Jesus Christ. He's our Savior. He saved us by his blood. And then he rose again. And he lives forever at the right hand of the Father. And makes intercession for us. And we can say the Lamb of God. He has prevailed. <laughs> he has prevailed. He has triumphed. And we will sing of the Lamb and the shed blood of Jesus. We will sing of it now. We will sing of it in heaven as well. So no matter how new our songs might be, we must never get away from the old ones as well. The old songs, and I can hear those of you who love to listen to David Deason and Roots 
um, Bible Radio 531 AM and you love, oh yes, I love those old songs. You're saying amen right now. Well, hang on to that because we need the new and we need the old. So when we worship, let's remember both of those. <laughs> let's go and worship the Lord one more time together.
I love watching these young people grow up, and I love the strength of their faith. I was praying the other day, and it just so touched my heart because everything in our lives we're spending building for this next generation. So all our heart's desire is is helping the next generation become and do greater things than we have ever done or become. We thought that there would never be hard days ahead for these young people. The 80s were over. The 90s were over. We've been through all the years of rice and salt. And sometimes the young people looked at us when we told those stories and kind of smiled at us. They Not sarcastically, but they've never been able to imagine days like that. Well, now they're beginning to understand days like that. But parents, you've raised your children strong, and you've raised your children with strong faith. Every generation has giants that they have to kill. That's one of the things I was reading in my own devotions the other day. You know, David killed his Goliath, and then there came along other Goliath's relatives that needed to be killed by the next generation. And there even came a point when a giant was about to kill David, and one of his younger men had to come along and save his life. The young men had to learn to carry the the strength that they had to carry the carry the load of, of some of the harder things and more difficult things to do. Parents, you've raised these kids strong. They've got their Goliaths to slay, but they will slay them. They're strong, their spirit, they're strong in their faith. Don't worry about these kids. They're going to do great in Jesus' name. We're proud of our young people. Now, I started talking to you this morning about something that's very, very important. We're, we're starting something for the, the frontliners. And let me emphasize, this is for frontliners. Let me emphasize again, this is for frontliners. Let me emphasize again, this is for frontliners. This is not for you to leave your house and go to the church. This is for frontliners. We call it the House of Prayer 91. Now later, we're going to open this to everybody under the Fortress 91 program. But right now, this is just for frontliners. Now, let's define frontliners. You are the people who are required to go to work. You work in banking. You're doctors, you're nurses, you work in the hospitals, you work in the grocery stores, uh, you work in delivery, but you are frontliners. In addition to that, I would say that every family has a frontliner. In most areas here in our beloved city, uh, everybody has a quarantine pass, one quarantine pass per household. So there's one person in the family that's the designated shopper. And you go out and you buy the food and bring it back for the family a couple of times a week. Now, that's the way it's supposed to work. I know some people are breaking curfew and the government's getting upset, but that's the way it's supposed to work. Now, operating under those guidelines, uh, we've sat down with some of the barangay captains and some of the city hall officials, and we're going to be doing something called House of Prayer 91. Again, this is not for seniors. You know, they won't even let me go. (laughs) I just, I was so disappointed. This is not for seniors. This is not for you to go to church. This is for frontliners. You are on your way to work or from work. You are on your way to the store or from the store. For instance, like in in East Campus, you're shopping in a PC supermarket underneath the church, or you're at North Campus, you're shopping at Robinson's underneath the church. All right. Now, main campus, there's what, four or five grocery stores around us. South Campus, there's one, two, three, four, five, six grocery stores around. But if you're on your way to the store, from the store, on your way to work, or coming from work, We want you to feel free to drop by our campuses. Now, if you are a frontliner, now I understand that the medical personnel do not have uh, a frontliner, they do not have a quarantine pass, but you have a frontliner PRCID. One of our members called this into me uh, this morning after devotion. So the medical frontliners have the PRCID, everybody else has these quarantine passes. Now, when you come to the church, the security guard will require that you show your P-R-C-I-D, or you show your quarantine pass, and a C-O-P-I-D. You need both a government pass and a C-O-P-I-D. Either one that you do not have with you, you will not be allowed in. We, we will take responsibility for our own members, all right? Now, frontliners or medical personnel or out shopping, family frontliners, you can go, you show your quarantine pass, you show your COP ID, uh, they'll take your temperature, you have to be wearing a mask. Uh, when you get inside the complex, you'll have to step in a foot bath. Now, shoes on, please, don't take your shoes off, shoes on, step in the foot bath. And then for a few minutes, main campus, you will go to the um, river room, all the other campuses, you'll go to the main auditorium. 
there'll be a pastor or a pastora there that will pray for you and serve you communion and remind you that Jesus has redeemed you from the curse of the plague. That Jesus has set you free. He has redeemed you from this curse of the this pestilence that sticks to us, as it says in Deuteronomy 28. This is a prayer of protection, and we want to begin to pray this for all of our frontliners. Now, yes, you can drop off your tithe and your seed. Yes, that's fine. But the main purpose of this is for a few moments of prayer. Now, even the CRs will not be open. I just warn you in advance. We're not opening up the buildings. Uh, we're operating on some pretty strict guidelines that we have to operate on so that we do not violate any of the restrictions of the government. Uh, but if you are a frontliner and you want prayer, we want to be there to serve communion to you and to pray for you. You will not be allowed to socialize with your friends, sit around in the chairs, have a chit chat. Uh, you will come in, be prayed for, have communion, and leave. Okay? Five, ten minutes tops. Because remember, you're either on your way to work or from work, or going home, you're on your way to the store or going home from the store. So this should only be a drop off for a couple of minutes to be prayed for and have communion served. So that will begin on May 1st in all campuses. Uh, we'll be making more announcements tomorrow on the exact time schedules, but it'll be a pretty wide time schedule during the day where you can stop by. Uh, the pastors will be wearing shields and face masks, and everybody will be asked to use alcohol in their hands. All the protocols will be followed, uh, but we just want to do something to serve our frontliners. You're in the area of the campuses. We want to be there to pray for you in Jesus' name. All right, let's go to a testimony now, and then we're going to get into the Word tonight. CLP family, this is Angelica Franco, owner of Season Supreme. We are manufactured sauces and condiments like ketchup, soy sauce, vinegar, mayonnaise, as you can see. We stopped our operations for almost three weeks due of enhanced community lockdown. But now we are resume both productions and delivery because of customers' demand. Almost of our competitors are not operational. Yet, this is the best time for us to get their market share. Truly, our sales increased by 75% and are all paid in cash. COP family, I encourage you not to look at the situation, but look for all possible opportunities. It's hard to understand and to comprehend that during lockdown, our sales go up. But this is not impossible for God. Everything is possible for God. God is good. I'm watching so many of our people, and you're doing so well. Now, our early focus in the early weeks, we're now in the seventh week, I guess, but in the early weeks, our focus was to stir people up to have small businesses so that if you're no work, no pay, there's money flowing and there's food on the table for your family. Now, I want to take things to the next step on that, and before we get into the Word tonight, I want to remind you of something I started talking to you about yesterday, and I, I talked with the, uh, in fact, all of the Connect Group leaders nationwide I was having different uh, Zoom calls with yesterday, and one of the things I talked with them to challenge you about is as we move out of this, before long, you're going to start getting calls to return to work. Please do not say, yeah, I don't know if I want to go back to my old job, you know. I only made 15000 or 18000 a month, and then I had to take my transportation and my food expenses out of that. And, you know, I could just stay home, and I'm making 20000 a month with my little business, and ah, I think I'll just keep my little business. Please, go back to work. Remember Elijah. God fed him by the brook with the ravens, but then that was just a temporary time of provision. Then God sent him to the little village, and the woman fed him with the oil and the little bit of flour. And that, again, was a temporary time of provision. Never confuse temporary provision with God's long-term will of provision. Now, keep your little side business going. But please remember, when we get back to the new normal, whatever the new normal is, all right, I, I, they keep talking about the new normal. In many ways, I don't think life is going to be that different, all right? But when we go back to regular life, you know, a lot of these little businesses are going to change. I mean, people aren't going to be buying lumpia from Sister Cruz up the street. They're not going to be buying, uh, you know, sweets, uh, cupcakes from the person up the street. They're, they're going to be stopping at Red Ribbon on the way home, just like they always used to, because they want their Red Ribbon again. So keep your little business, yes, and try to keep things going with it, yes. But let your major source of income be your job. Never confuse temporary provision 
with God's long-term plan to provide for your life. All right? Now, let's get into the Word. We started on this last night in the service. Uh, Mark chapter 13, beginning with verse 1. As Jesus came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what wonderful stones and what, what wonderful buildings. Now, you have to understand, folks, these... These were beautiful stones. Even today, when you go down to some of the lower areas at the Western Wall, or you go down to some of the underground tunnels underneath the walls, and you see some of the ancient stones, these stones were beautifully finished. And for that day, this was magnificent. Look, teacher, what wonderful stones and what wonderful buildings. And Jesus said to him, do you see these buildings? There will not be one here. There will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. He prophesies about the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. As he sat on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, so they're looking now back at the temple across from the Kidron Valley, Peter and James and John and Andrew ask him privately, tell us, when will these things be and what will be the sign that all these things are about to be accomplished? And Jesus began, now this is not all the teaching on this, but he began to say to them, see that no one misleads you. Many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and they will lead many astray. And you will hear wars and rumors of wars. Do not be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines, but these are but the beginning of the birth pains. Now, that was our key thought last night. These are but the beginning of the birth pains. But be on your guard, for they will deliver you over to councils, and you will be beaten in synagogues. You will stand before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them. And the gospel must first be preached to all nations. And when they bring you to trial and deliver you over, do not be anxious beforehand what you are to say. But say whatever is given you in that hour, for it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. And brother will deliver brother over to death, and the father his child, and children will rise against their parents and have them put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. Now, last night I began to tell you that there are birth pains that Jesus describes. This is the same phrase that Paul uses in Romans chapter 8, verses 18 through 25, that all creation groans going through the pains of childbirth, Romans 8, verse 22. When, when sin touched this world, it didn't just affect mankind. It didn't just affect Adam and Eve. It affected every animal, every plant, every type of grass, every fish, every bird, every insect, every bacteria, every virus. Everything was corrupted. Romans 8 there, verses 18 to 25, talks about creation has been corrupted, and it's, it's waiting for its redemption. Now, there will come a day when Jesus will put his feet back on this earth. It's called the millennium, when Jesus will rule and reign for a thousand years. We will have our glorified bodies. In those days, we will see the world as God intended it to be, where everything was very good, where there's no more predatory instinct, the lion and the lamb will lay down together, where we will see the truth of how everything was created before sin corrupted and changed God's creation. You know, young people walk up and say, Pastor Summer, why did God create, you know, pneumonia bacteria? And, and the, you know, when, when bacteria was created, it was good. I mean, please, we drink your cult, diba, because it puts good bacteria in our stomach that is needed for digestion. So there are good uses of bacteria in this world. I don't know what the good uses of viruses are, but I'm sure that there's some reason in creation that God created viruses. Now, did God create the coronavirus? No, this is a corruption of God's creation. But I want you to understand that creation is going through the pains of childbirth. And this is what Jesus said, there are pains of childbirth. So we talked last night about the fact that this is a season of childbirth. This is a season of birth pains for all creation. These birth pains mean that it's unstoppable. There's a flow of life. Jesus is going to come back. It means that there is going to be some pain involved. It means there's a little bit of unpredictability in it. It means that there, there's going to be a growth in intensity. These things are going to get closer to closer together. They're going to get more and more frequent just before the birth takes place. 
So you and I have to understand we are living in a season of birth pains. And I used the illustration last night. I taught you that I, I grew up on the Gulf Coast of Alabama for a part of my life. And I was always amazed at how quickly houses would be destroyed by typhoons. And when I was a young man, 23 years old, and I moved to the Philippines, and I found out that we have 23 to 26 typhoons every year, I wondered, my goodness, how, did, how does the country survive? And then I realized how clever everybody is here in the Philippines. We build for typhoons. Everything's concrete. If you go to Florida, you'll see that people build their houses out of two by fours, and they don't even use plywood. They use this, what I call glue wood. It's the chips of wood glued together to make them look like plywood. And a wind comes and just blows it over. When they build a concrete wall, they don't put a reinforcing column in it or a cross beam across it. They don't fill in the hollow blocks with concrete. They just lay hollow blocks. And when the wind comes, it just poof, blows the whole thing over. Here in the Philippines, we build a hollow block wall. We have reinforcing beams through the middle of it. We have columns going up through it of solid poured concrete with reinforcing steel. We have steel that are put down in the middle of the hollow block walls. We, have, we fill in the, the hollow blocks with concrete. And when the wind of the typhoon comes, we just sit there and smile at it. We build for the season we live in. Now, that said, if we live, and prophetically we live in the season of birth pains, and if we really believe Jesus is coming soon, then we need to realize these things that we've just read about are going to happen in ever-increasing intensity. So we need to build our businesses, our careers, our families. We need to build our lives to withstand these things. Part of that would be to stay out of debt in Jesus' name and, and live cash. I mean, I, I can remember the hell we walked through at COP when we had heavy debt during the, the financial crisis years. And my goodness, when you're, you're tied to that world system and the world system is reeling, you, you reel right along with it. But when you're debt-free, you sit back and you smile. Now, last night we began to talk about in this season of birth pains, we have to watch out for deceptions. We talked about who those deceptions come through. We talked about, in addition to watching out for deceptions, we have to watch out for fear. We can't let fear grip our hearts. Jesus said, you know what? These things are going to happen. Verse 7, it says, do not be alarmed. They must take place. These things must take place. The earthquakes, the famines, the plagues, these things must take place. So don't be afraid. Now, I want to pick up from there and begin to talk about the birth pain season that is ever increasing in intensity is a time that we also have to learn how to build our lives for persecution. Now, Talking about persecution in the Philippines is a hard thing because, you know what, we may have more religious freedom than any other nation in the world. I mean, we are amazingly free. Now, I know that we've got some conspiracy theory people right now in the Philippines that are saying the government is trying to destroy the church. And Folks, no. I mean, when we talk to the barangay officials and city hall officials and government officials about what can we do and what can we not do, nobody's wanting to destroy the church. Nobody's wanting to destroy the work of God. I mean, we, we are blessed to live in this land. There are, yes, maybe the government officials are, are a little over-afraid. Yes, I understand that. Yes, yes, yes. We can, we can have that debate at another time. But we don't really have that much religious persecution. We do from time to time, but we don't have that much religious persecution. But in the days that we're living in, forgive me, as a pastor, I have to warn you, that as the intensity of, of the birth pains increases, of these prophetic birth pains increase, Jesus said, we're going to face persecution. Now, look at me in Luke 21, beginning with verse 11. There will be earthquakes, and in various places, famines and pestilences. There will be terrors and great signs from heaven. But before all these, they will lay their hands on you and persecute you and deliver you to their synagogues and prisons. And you will be brought before kings and governors for my, namesake, for my namesake. This will be your opportunity to bear witness. Now, as I taught you last night, some of these verses are dealing with the specific lives of the apostles. Some of them are Jesus teaching the Jews how to live during the millennium. 
excuse me, not during during the Great Tribulation. And some of these are applicable to all of this. So there's, you know, like with most prophecy, there's a, there's a an interweaving of of times and seasons together. Mark chapter 13, verse 9, be on your guard, for they will deliver you over to councils, and you will be beaten in synagogues. And you will stand before governors and kings for my name's sake to bear witness before them. So persecution, first of all, is going to come from false religions. You are going to see more and more, as we get closer and closer to the return of our Lord, you're going to see more and more false religions go after Christianity. And sometimes that false religion is science, and sometimes that false religion is secular society. They've, they've made a religion of it. I mean, people, people put their faith in it. I was listening to a man on the news the other day said, we must put our faith in science. We must trust science. Now, if I looked at the guy and I said, we must put our faith in God, we must trust God, he would look at me like I was crazy, like I was an uneducated buffoon. But when I listen to him say, we must put our faith in science, we must put our faith in, and trust in science, I look at them and I go, you know, you're, you're prophets of science. You prophesied with your algorithms and you prophesied with all of your, your curves that this was going to happen and that was going to happen with this plague. And you know what? You've been wrong every time. So your, your science prophets are wrong. I say all that not to criticize, but just to say secular society has its science and it is really becoming a religion. If you don't believe me, go back and look at how, pe how strongly people fight for Darwinism. And, you know, I sat down with a, a debate one time with a guy on evolution versus creation. And I looked at it and I said, you know, you have to have a lot of faith to believe that what started out as a single cell, as a single protein, developed through all of the others and became this complex thing called a human being. I said, it takes great faith that that many mutations can occur. And you look around the world today, and I don't see any of these mutations happening today. Are you saying that evolution stopped? Oh, it takes great faith to believe in some of this stuff. So some of this will be coming from secular society. It, it has become a religion. Some of this will be coming from false religions. Now, these false religions will begin to persecute Christianity more and more and more. Some of this persecution will come from governments. Mark 13, verses 9 to 11, governors and kings for my sake. Luke chapter 21, verse 12, before kings and governors for my name's sake. There, there are going to be governments that persecute Christianity. Uh, I can walk you through some of the nations of Africa. We can go up to China. It's a horrible persecution of Christians happening right now in China. I, I mean, churches being blown up with dynamite and demolished, pastors being put in jail, churches being closed. There's horrible persecution of Christianity taking place in China right now. And sometimes because we're so blessed in the Philippines, we, we think that could never happen here. But you know what? One day we might see a change, and it might happen here. There will be persecution, Jesus said, coming from our families. Luke chapter 21, verse 16, you will be delivered up even by parents and brothers and relatives and friends, and some of you they will put to death. Mark 13, verse 12, brother will betray brother to death, and a father his child. Children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. Now, again, I mean, you, you look at this and you go, Pastor, that would never happen. Our, our families are so strong. But in other parts of the world, it's happening. There are people being born again, for instance, in some Middle East nations that I won't mention. And when they get born again, their families turn them in. And oftentimes these people are beaten, flogged, and executed. But they were turned in by their families. You know, you would never think that family would turn on family because here in the Philippines, our families are so strong. But as we see the intensity of the birth pains continue and we see the frequency getting closer together, we may even begin to see this in our own beloved nation. Persecution will come from non-Christians. Jesus said in Luke 21, verse 17, you will be hated by all for my name's sake. Mark 13, verse 13, and you will be hated by all for my name's sake. Now, emphasis on the word all. I, I do not understand modern Christianity that wants to be popular with the world. 
that wants the world to love them. And so we become like them and we make our songs like them and we dress like them and we, we go knock back our shooters in the bars and clubs with them. And, you know, we want the world to accept us. We call it engaging the culture. Jesus never engaged the culture. The culture and came and engaged Jesus and got saved, but Jesus never went and became a part of them and dressed like them and participated with them in their sin to try to get them to like him. Jesus never went to the great Roman gladiators in the arenas. They had them right there in Sabaudi. They had them right there in, in Caesarea. But Jesus never went to any of that. Jesus was a conservative rabbi. He never went out and acted like he was part of the world. He was in this world, but not of this world, and that's what he calls us to be. Now, young people, I just challenge you today. You're going to have to get over this need to be popular. I mean, you're going to have to just get over this, because forgive me, you're not going to be popular with the world. You are a Christian. You bear the name of Jesus. Bear it with honor. Don't bear it with shame. Bear it with honor. Now, this persecution is going to intensify in, in these days that we live in. So how does Jesus teach us to respond to this persecution? Well, first of all, let's deal with our attitudes. Luke chapter 21, verse 13. Notice what Jesus says. This will be your opportunity to bear witness. Now, that's the first thing you've got to get a hold of. This persecution that comes against you, whether it comes from family, government, religion, the world, wherever it comes from, persecution is an opportunity. It should not be looked on as a curse. It should be looked on as an opportunity. You see, when you get persecuted, everybody's eyes are focused on you. Even people that hate you, they're watching you. The eyes of the world focus on persecution. Now, Paul understood this, so Paul used it. Every time Paul was persecuted, he used it as an opportunity to preach the gospel. Now, I, I've watched a lot of preachers across my short life, and I looked at Billy Graham, and I used to just so admire Billy Graham, because you put a microphone in his hand on secular television, and he's going to preach the gospel. He's going to get it in there. And I watch his son, Franklin Graham, and Franklin has been so persecuted lately in Europe. His, his crusades were shut down because the homosexual community said he was anti-homosexual and he hated people and he, he practiced hate speech. And Franklin Graham does not do that. He's a really good man and he loves people. But I, I've watched him, instead of fighting back, he used this persecution as an opportunity, not to defend himself, but every interview he did, I watched him present the gospel. And you sit back and you look at it and you just want to weep with tears of joy because you know, I've watched so many other preachers, forgive me, they're all about being liked. But Franklin Graham acts just like his father. Every time he opens his mouth, psh, out comes the gospel. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing to watch. He has understood this truth that persecution is an opportunity. Now, when you get persecuted in the universities, young people, everybody's watching you. So rather than fight back, rather than defend yourself, use the audience that persecution creates to present Jesus. Ah, there we go. Use the opportunity, the, the audience that has been created now, I don't know why people like to watch persecution, but they do. Why do people like to drive by a car accident and everybody slows down to look? You know, I, I don't know what it is in human nature, but watching somebody be persecuted, watching somebody be hurt, seems to attract the attention of the world. So now that you have this audience of people watching you be hurt and persecuted and spoken against and criticized and everything, use it as an opportunity to present Jesus. Secondly, Jesus teaches us to be on our guard. Mark 13, verse 9. So be on your guard. Now, the Greek word here, blepo, B-L-E-P-O, means to be cautious or watchful. So in other words, you know, learn how to duck, okay? You know, yes, use it as an opportunity, but 
you know, if I told you somebody was going to hit you upside the head with a two by four as you walked out my apartment door, you would be watchful. And you would you would know how to duck, Diba. You're not going to just walk right into it and let somebody slap you upside the head with a two by four. You would be watchful. So what you have to learn to do is be watchful. Have eyes to see and ears to hear. Be cognizant of your surroundings, not just in a secular way, but in a spiritual way. Understand that there are things that you can do that will, will intensify persecution. So be on your guard. Be, be cautious. Be watchful. Thirdly, trust the Holy Spirit for your defense. Now, I want you to notice there in Mark 13, 11. Whenever you are arrested and brought to trial, do not worry beforehand what to say. Don't sit there and craft out your defense. Don't sit there and think out everything to say. He said, just go to sleep. Go to sleep. Just say whatever is given you at the time, for it is not you speaking, but the Holy Spirit. Now, I've been through this a few times in my life. I've done it the wrong way, and I've done it the right way. Doing it the wrong way, you know me, I'm always, I always over-prepare. And I thought through everything I was going to say, and if they say this, then I'm going to say that. And if they respond this way, I'm going to say that way. And I laid all these trails of, of, of thought down, and it didn't go very well. Other times when I've gone through this, I've learned, I'm just going to walk in there and trust Jesus. Have a good night's sleep. Get up, read my Bible, pray, go face it. And you know, it's amazing. The Holy Spirit will give you wisdom that no one can stand up against. Ah, trust the Holy Spirit. Fourthly, continue to preach the gospel. Mark 13, 10. And this gospel must first be preached to all nations. Now, my friends, please, 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 please. Persecution, famines, pestilence, earthquakes, volcanoes, economic crisis. Nothing absolves us from the command of the Great Commission. I'm going to work more on that Great Commission tomorrow night. But brothers and sisters, I want you to hear my heart. I want you to hear, more importantly, Jesus' heart. The most important thing that we do in life is not earn a living, it's not build our house, it's not grow our business. The most important thing we do in life is to preach the gospel. Now, I know it's a little difficult right now, but we're still finding ways. We've got trio crusades. We've got harvest visits. We've got everything that we used to do. We're doing it now by digital. Now, that's not the best way to do it, and we'll get back to doing it the, the best way before long. But we're still making use of everything that we can put our hands on to share the gospel. You know, I'm sitting here looking at how do we do crusades the rest of the year in the provinces because, you know, people are going to be concerned about crowds of people and large gatherings. And, you know, we may have to change how we do things a little bit. But my friends, we're still going to preach the gospel. You know, we are never absolved from the Great Commission. We are never set free from the responsibility of the Great Commission. Lastly, we're to endure. Luke 21, verse 17, you'll be hated by all men for my name's sake, but not a hair of your head will perish. He said, but he who endures, verse 13, Mark 13, 13, you'll be hated for my name's sake, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. Sometimes you just got to hold on. I mean, I think of the churches right now in, in the southern Tagalog area. I think of the churches in Batangas. I think of the churches in Cavite, the, the side close to Batangas. So first, they get hit by the volcano. And they have no services for how many weeks? And their whole lives are tossed upside down. There's a birth pain. There was a contraction. And a volcano went off. And now we have this virus. Another birth pain. Another contraction takes place. But you know what? Jesus said, the one who endures to the end shall be saved. I think of Pastor Manny down there with his pastors in the Tanawan area. I think of all the ministerial associations we've worked with. I think of those pastors. And I think of those churches. And I pray for them daily. I mean, I know these men. I've met with these men. We've, we've worked together. We've prayed for the sick together. Guys, you have to endure. You have to hold on. Pastors, if you're listening to me down through the southern Tagalog area right now, 
Hold on to Jesus right now. This will pass and it will be well with you. This does not destroy your churches. Your churches are going to grow bigger and greater than ever before in Jesus' name. We endure to the end. Now, let me take it just a little bit farther tonight. Some of this I taught you last night, but I want to teach it to you from a little different perspective. No, I better stop there tonight because we don't want to get too late. I want to talk to you again about the um, Zoom business that we're going to be doing. Uh, now, now, by Zoom business, I mean business seminars. We're not going to be selling things on Zoom. Uh, we focus most of our attention to this point on helping people get food on the table. Because, forgive me, I grew up poor. Okay, I, I know what it's like to go to bed hungry. Okay, I, I understand that. We lived through the 80s and 90s together. We, we understand those days. And those are hard. Those are hard days. And our people are hard workers, but sometimes they just need an idea. So we spend a lot of time encouraging and giving them ideas. And people are doing well now. Now we need to work on the next level in the church, and those are the business people. Because, you know, they're going, where do we get the money to operate? You know, the companies that owe us money we can't collect from because they don't have offices, but the government keeps wanting us to pay salaries. What are we going to do? We, we put together a series of eight to ten um, Zoom conferences where it's part teaching and part question and answer, where we have some of our top business people and our board members uh, do some training. Everything from how do you negotiate with the banks to you know renegotiate your loan after this situation? Uh, what, what are the laws regarding um, retrenching staff? What are the laws regarding uh, rentals that you for buildings that you've been renting and you haven't been able to you haven't been allowed to do business? So we're going to have some of our legal experts, some of our business experts, really walk you through and teach you uh, financial forecasting between now and the end of the year. What new opportunities are being created by the quote new normal? That seems to be everybody's new word today, the new normal. Now, if you'd like to be a part of that, if you contact your district pastor and say, I would like to be a part of that. We're going to put together the first group of 90, and then we'll keep replaying that one so that everybody gets through it. All right? I don't want to make, I don't want to make all of our volunteers teach 20 times, all right? But we'll, we'll put together one set of 10, and as soon as we finish one, we'll start uh, cascading it down to everybody else. We'll be putting together groups of about 90 people to, to, to watch this. Now, you say, well, Pastor, I don't know who my district pastor is. Well, that means you're not getting phone calls. And Every member of our church should be getting a phone call every three days by their district pastor to pray for you, to check on you, and to see how you're doing during this entire seven weeks so far. If you're not getting a phone call, just go online and look up the chart that has all of our district pastors on it and call any one of them and say, hey, nobody's calling me, and we'll make sure that we get the proper district pastor in touch with you right away. Sometimes numbers get transposed when they enter them into the computers and stuff, and so please forgive us for this, but we want to take good care of you. All of that to say, contact your district pastor, and then we'll start putting this together in the next week or so. God bless you. We'll see you again tomorrow morning.